Hey, everyone, and welcome to Chef AJ Live. I'm your host, Chef AJ, and this is where I introduce you to amazing people like you who are doing great things in the world that I think you should know about. Well, today is show 1616, 1616. And who would think that twice in one week I get two people from Mississippi? That has never happened. If you haven't seen Monday's show with Shane and Simple, Shane Martin, it's fantastic. And today I have another plant-based treasure in the Deep South, which is not exactly known for the healthiest cuisine. She's a registered dietitian. She's plant-based, I believe, for almost 20 years. Her name is Jen Moore, and she's going to be talking about plant-based kidney protection made easy. Please welcome her to the show. It's so nice to meet you. Great to meet you. I'm so excited to be here, Chef AJ. Thank you so much. It's a complete honor. Oh, I am so excited because I saw you on the Real Truth About Health conference. I didn't get to watch very many of the speakers, but I guess I was meant to watch you and you gave a wonderful presentation and I can't wait to hear about it because, you know, kidney health is, you know, people don't think about their kidneys until- right something happens, you know, it's kind of like, you know, like we go to the dentist regularly, most, most people do. And then we never really think about our teeth until they hurt. But with kidneys, it's not like kidneys even tell us when they're, you know, exactly. it's not one of those things. It's kind of like a non-alcoholic fatty liver. It's like, you don't know you have it often. People can mm -hmm. be, I had a, 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 a student at the Braille Institute that basically went blind after she went diabetic. She didn't even know. She mm -hmm. didn't even know the symptoms. So I'm really excited about this topic because plant-based is such a great way to, to save your kidneys. It is, it is. And it really is, you know, I always say that kidney patients are, or you know, kind of the stepchild that got forgotten. You know, everyone knows what a pink ribbon is. Everybody knows about, you know, cancer and heart disease, but people forget about um, people with kidney disease. And the other bad thing about kidney disease is that it's silent. So many times people um, find out their kidneys have failed because they crash into the ER and they're, they can't breathe. They're short of breath. They're swollen. Um, and next thing they know, they're told, I'm sorry, your kidneys have failed. And right in this very minute, we have to put a shunt in your neck because you have to have dialysis. And so um, it's just really important to raise awareness, to have people get screened if they're diabetic or hypertensive, get your kidneys screened every year, um, and then live a healthy lifestyle so that your kidneys don't fail. I know we don't, a lot of times we don't think about it. We take better care of our cars. So before you jump in, I know you have a wonderful presentation planned. You're a registered dietitian. You're in the right. deep south. How the heck did you end up becoming? A vegan? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so this is hilarious because um, I'm not only from Mississippi. I grew up in the most unhealthy part of the state of Mississippi, which is the most unhealthy state in the nation. So I grew up in the Mississippi Delta. It's totally flat. Nobody there eats plant-based. I had never heard of it a day in my life. Um, people eat meat there and that meat is fried. And so um, I, when I was growing up, my mom um, was always a picture of health to me. We lived in one of those old Southern homes and she stayed home with us, and, but she wanted to run. And so she would run in the house, like five miles in the house. So she didn't have to leave us when we were little kids. And so, you know, I kind of saw that and saw that model. And then when I was in college, um, I didn't really know what I wanted to do. And she mentioned to me, um, well, why don't you be a dietitian? She had a friend whose daughter was a dietitian. And so I became a dietitian. But even then, I didn't learn anything about plant-based nutrition in college. And so then I went on to be a dietitian. You have to do um, four years of undergrad, then intern. Now you have to get a master's degree, which I got my master's degree later, but then you just intern. And so I interned at Vanderbilt Medical Center in Nashville, Tennessee. And one of my preceptors just taught a class on plant-based nutrition. And then she said, if you want to know more, you need to read Diet for a New America by John Robbins. And so this was way back in 1997. And so I read the book. And so my mind started churning. And over the years, I just started, you know, it kind of be on again, off again. Well, then um, when my, I have four children, when my third child um, was born, I read The China Study by T. Colin Campbell. And that was really what kind of pushed me over the edge. And I was like, you know what? This science is really nailed down on plant-based nutrition being the superior way to eat. And so I started eating that way. And interestingly, um, my family has a very strong um, genetic predisposition to cardiovascular disease. And I've even had my genes run and know that I have those genes, the E3, E4 genes. Um, but I'm the only one in my family not on blood pressure medicine, the only one not on cholesterol lowering medicine, and all my numbers are fine. And it comes from just my plant-based lifestyle and exercise. And that's how I do it. 
That's amazing. So what, what, what was that transition like for you and your family? And, and what is it like living in the deep South? I'm guessing it's not a Mecca for veganism. No, it's not. Um, in, initially, it was kind of hard because back then, you know, it, let's see, that would have been in the early 2000s. I mean, it wasn't as mainstream as it is now. You know, there weren't all the, you know, um, different documentaries and books and podcasts and things like that. And so, you know, people kind of looked at me like I was a little bit strange. Um, and even now, I mean, people will be like, you don't eat meat. Like it's, it's not common. Um, but I guess I, this, I'm so grounded in the science. I know for sure that it is the superior way to eat, that it just really doesn't bother me anymore. Like it used to, when I was younger, I'm just like, yep, I don't. I say, I'll tell people I don't and I won't because they'll think, oh, well, you can just this one time. Like if we got to eat dinner, you can just this. And I'm like, nope, I don't. And I won't. And so, um, I love that. We're going to get a t-shirt. I don't. And I won't. That's right. (laughs) (laughs) But they also see like, wow, she has four kids. I'm 48 years old. I still exercise. I still have a lot of energy. And, and, and then, you know, I can talk about the science and people, I think now kind of notice and like, wow, you know, she might be onto something. So, um, anyway, but it's, it is a bit of a challenge to find places to eat. Like, I don't know if you're familiar, I'm sure you're familiar with the happy cow app. Sure. So if you go to the Delta, it's going to say no places found. It's going to say that there's <laughs> nothing found there. This, this so, does not exist. <laughs> yes. So you have to plan, like you have to take food with you. But um, in Memphis, there's a few, I'm, I'm just south of Memphis, Tennessee. I'm as far north in Mississippi as you can get before you're in Memphis. Even Memphis is the barbecue capital, you know, um, but there are a few like places you can go out to eat in Memphis. Um, but, you know, I've learned to do things like order the sides at a restaurant or go to a deli and get a salad or, you know, things like that. So it, it typically works out. Yeah. You know, I, I don't travel much anymore, but I do remember there was a 10 year period where I was probably flying to a different city to speak every week. And I was always able to find something in an airport except for Memphis. That was like the only <laughs> place there was literally, I don't, I don't even know if they had a banana, you know, I think they yeah. were outlawed there. That's hilarious. You yeah. live in the bacon belt, basically. I do. I do. The stroke belt is it's actually called the stroke belt where mm-hmm. I live. Yeah. Well, thank goodness they have you there. Well, you look amazing. Did you uh, start out like as a registered dietitian that was working in a hospital with patients? Is that the trajectory mm-hmm. of your career? Um, I did that for just a very, very short period of time. When I graduated um, from Vanderbilt, I worked uh, doing hospital relief in um, Nashville. And then I went straight into dialysis, which you can't even do anymore. Um, Now you have to work a year before you can do dialysis. But I did years and years on dialysis. Um, And so not on dialysis, working in dialysis. And um, but I was a plant based dietitian and I. I started noticing, like when I was working on my master's degree, I was like, okay, I used to think plant-based nutrition and kidney disease kind of didn't go together because people on dialysis, they, they have such higher protein needs, which I'll go through this in my presentation. Yeah, that's but, really interesting. I, 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 they do have to eat a little bit different diet, don't they? Oh, for sure. For sure. But I started noticing like, okay, why are there dialysis centers going up on every corner in Memphis, like a Walgreens? Like there's got to be something we can do to slow this progression. So all my research in my master's program was towards that. And I started looking at Europe and I was like, my gosh, they're putting these people on low protein diets. And then if they're really far along, they put them on a very low protein diet and they supplement back with something called a keto analog of amino acid. And they were keeping people off dialysis for years and years. Um, But back then we didn't have keto analogs here. And so when I finished my, my master's program, I was actually living in Vegas for a little while while my husband was finishing the air force, he's retired air force. And um, when I was out there, I said, you know what, I'm going to start just working with pre dialysis patients too. I'm just going to actually, someone heard me speak and they said, I want you to work with my dad. So I said, okay, I'll do it. And so I started working with him and I said, look, I don't even know if this will work, but we're going to put you on a plant-based diet and we're going to supplement with amino acids because we didn't have keto analogs then. And we kept him. He was 84 years old. His doctors were ready to start dialysis right then. And I can show you his numbers in my presentation. We kept him off dialysis for 16 months. That's 16 months of life, not on a machine, tied to a machine 
three times a week for three to five hours. That's what a, a in-center hemodialysis patient, they sit in a chair for three to five hours, three times a week. We kept him away from that for 16 months. And that's 16 months of quality life. And it may not, that may not sound like much to, to some of the listeners, but it is a lot um, when you know what dialysis actually entails. And so um, that just really spurred me on. And so I started seeing people. I said, listen, I don't want you to pay me a dime if you'll just give me your data. And so I started following people. And that's when I wrote my first book. Um, because I wanted to just raise awareness about it. And then um, after that, patients started reading that book. I wrote it for practitioners, but patients started reading it. And then they asked me to write a second one. Patients would say, hey, you didn't do this or you didn't do that. And so um, my second book came out in April of this year. And I've been posting the link in both the chat and the show notes so people can get the book. And it, it, does the book have recipes in it? It does. And here's what it here's here's what I did with the book, because this was from feedback from people that people will tell to me, tell me um, they're not going to read a big, long book. And I don't cook. That's what they say. I don't cook. OK. And I'm like, OK, well, you need to start. <laughs> but what we're going to do is every section in this book will be 10 pages or less. So it's not that much reading. And every recipe in this book, it's five ingredients or less. Now, if you are a chef, like Chef AJ, and you want to add two to make them taste a little bit better, a little bit different, please, by all means, do. But if you are someone who tells me, I don't cook, you can at least do this. It's five ingredients or less, and everything you can find at your local grocery store, or if it's if it's even halfway obscure, I'll put in the recipe, like, where to get it. Well, you know what? Even though I'm, quote, a real chef, I don't cook like a real chef. I eat the same darn thing every day. And just, I, I, <laughs> I mean, I don't even need seasoning anymore. You know, I mean, honestly, food tastes so good to me now, but that's so cool. Yeah. When you went uh, plant-based, did you, 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 you said it was your third pregnancy that you, uh, third out of four? Well, after he was born, right. Mm -hmm. So what did you do with all the kids, the ones that came before, the ones that came after, the husband, did they join you on your journey? The husband joined me. So um, he said we were we were married um, later in life. So the first three children aren't his. I have to tell you a story about my fourth child. But um, he said he didn't think I'd date him <laughs> if he didn't switch. So he did. And he's been plant based ever since. A smart, he's it. a smart man, isn't he? Yeah. <laughs> and um, so my daughter eats plant-based and my youngest son eats plant-based. The other two I haven't converted yet. But um, I'll tell you about the baby. So um he is 11 now, and um, this will just tell you a little bit about the power of plant-based nutrition and healing. So I, um, when my husband and I got married, I told him, I said, listen, I can't have any more children because I've had an endometrial ablation. That's where they cauterize the inside of your uterus. And I said, I can't have any more children. It's like a 0.03% chance that I'll ever have children. So I just wanted you to know that because he didn't have any kids. And so he said, that's fine. And so after we had been married about a year, I started feeling really pregnant. And I was like, there's no way. And so I go and I get a cheap pregnancy test from the dollar store because I just knew I could not possibly be pregnant. And um, so we're going out to dinner that night and I took the pregnancy test and it comes up positive. And I was like, I told him, I was like, I'm pregnant. So we go to the doctor and they were like, oh, this is not going to turn out good. Women who've had this procedure, you will miscarry. Like you will never have this child. Just don't get excited. And we were like, okay. So 13 weeks came and went. Everything was fine. They sent me to a specialist and they, you know, monitored me, ultrasounds all the time, checking the baby's heart rate. Everything was fine. And so then when we get to um, delivery, they said, OK, well, since you have had this procedure, you're going to have to have a C-section because the placenta won't come away from the uterine wall and it's dangerous. And so we're like, OK. And so um, go in, have the C-section. Placenta comes away beautifully from the uterine wall. The baby is perfectly healthy and beautiful. And so I asked my doctor, I said, hey, what did my uterus look like in there? And he said, it looked like you never had anything done. Like I had completely healed the lining mm -hmm. of that uterus. I mean, and this is, this is this incredible story. People say they're getting chills. I just, I just don't like how in medicine, I mean, even if what they said was true, it, I don't think it's great the way they present things like that to patients, you know? Right. But well, you stayed out optimistic. <laughs> it didn't, it didn't matter because <laughs> this baby was meant to be and meant to be healthy. That's amazing. That's right. So this one could have been raised this way because he, he, he was, he, yes. Yeah. He, he doesn't know any difference. So that's amazing. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. 
Wow. What a great story. I, you know, I know you got a presentation. We're going to get to it, but you're just so charming and fun to talk to. And before we logged on, you, you told me a story that I think is really important about some volunteer missionary work you did. Yeah. And I, I just think it's, I, first of all, thank you for doing volunteer work. I love that in general, but it's just so what the story you told me was so interesting uh, because it involved coffee, which, you know, we have, uh, people always have their own opinion, but in general, m- most of the experts on this show, they're plant-based doctors and they don't think coffee is the holy grail. Like it's coffee and alcohol get touted as having health benefits. But for most people, I don't see that, at least in the people I work with. And in the story you told, it was actually really detrimental. Yeah, yeah. So this summer, I just got back from um, Guatemala. So I was um, in church and... um, I had prayed that the Lord would help me use my, my skills to help other people even more than what I was doing. And so this, this opportunity was presented to me that uh, my church was going to, uh, it's an orphanage called Casa Alleluia, and it's in um, Guatemala. And that she said, some of the children in this orphanage are on dialysis, their kidneys have failed. And so I was like, okay, that I'm supposed to go. And so I went over there and um, there were, there were all these children in this, the reason, the reason the ones that were in the, in the orphanage, the reason they were there is their kidneys had failed and their parents um, said, well, we can't possibly afford to take care of this child. So they sent him to Casa Alleluia. And there's a man there named Araldo and he takes care of these children. He takes them back and forth to Guatemala city. If they have doctor appointments, he, um, they do peritoneal dialysis, which is dialysis that you do at home. It's a, um, they do it while they sleep at night. But if those, if those machines alarm, Araldo gets up in the night and takes care of these kids. Um, but I was also afforded the opportunity. I went into Guatemala city and I got to work with one of the dietitians there at the hospital just to learn. I just wanted to learn. And, um, I asked her, I said, you know, like, why are all these kids going into renal failure here like what is the deal because we were seeing all these kids coming in that had had kidney transplants or they were on dialysis and she said oh there's lots of reasons you know one is the water which I didn't mention to you the water there is um very very dirty they it's um just toxic but um also the um she said that they're really malnourished and the moms put coffee in the baby bottles and I was like why you know and so then and so I just kind of was like that's really strange and so I go on about well the last day we were there um we went to Antigua just for kind of a a day to kind of recuperate from all the work we had done at the um at the orphanage and we went to a coffee plantation and the guy said the moms put coffee in the baby bottles and I was like okay I'm asking why why do you put coffee in the baby bottles? And he said, they can't afford anything else. And I was just like, so much of it was devastating. Like, even when I came home and I would talk to my husband about it, I would just cry. Um, because that's the moms there think they're doing something. It's better than nothing. They think if they, if they feed their child, nothing. And they said, coffee's cheap. So they just put it in the baby bottles. And then these kids go into renal failure and, um, so it's kind of been my mission since I've gotten back to raise awareness about that. Um, the orphanage has a um, it has a, a hospital on site that they're trying to open because right now there's more than 10 kids that need to come there that need dialysis and they just don't have the capacity right now. So I do have if anyone has kidney issues and wants to learn about how to slow progression of kidney disease, I have an eight week program, um, which I'll sh- I have a, a um QR and, code at the end of this presentation. And it's linked in the show notes, the, 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 your book, your website, your Instagram, and the program. You know, dialysis is not fun for anyone, but I can't imagine it being fun for a young child who probably doesn't even no. know why they're getting it. You know, I used to be an activity director 20 years ago at a retirement home. And um, on the weekends, there was no driver. And I worked on the weekend. So I had to drive people to their dialysis. And I, at first, of all, they, first of all, they never looked forward to it. I can tell you that. And no. they would come home just so wiped out. Right. So exhausted, like they couldn't get out of bed for like a day, you know? Yeah, 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 yeah it's hard. I mean, um, most of those kids, they there's only one that goes to, there's different types of dialysis. So you've got peritoneal, which is what most of them do at night while they sleep. Um, but then you've got uh, hemo, in-center hemodialysis. One of the kids dr- has to drive three times a week to hemodialysis, which is what you're talking about, which is really hard. But um, 
anyway, that eight week program, I, I wrote it before I went, but now um, anything I any proceeds from that, I'm sending um, towards the work with the kids in Guatemala. So, um, but yeah, it is hard. And I mean, there are children in America that are on dialysis too, but America makes dialysis accessible. Whereas in Guatemala, it's much less accessible for especially people who are living in extreme poverty. Yeah, well, thank you for, for that work. You know, it must be very gratifying. Coffee is very dehydrating, isn't it? It is, it is, it's a diuretic. Yeah, I thought so. Yeah. Well, um, you, want, you want to jump into your presentation? I could just keep sure. talking to you because you're so fun to talk to. And I'd love to know more about what you eat and what you feed your family. But you did come to give a presentation. So let's watch it and then we can talk some more afterwards. Okay, well, that sounds great. I'm going to, um, I'm pulling it up right now. And let's see, I'm going to, hold on. Let me make sure I get the screen shared that I want to share. Okay. 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 Do you see my screen? I don't. I don't. I'm sorry to say. Is it pulled up? I, is it pulled up on your oh. desktop? Of, now. What I about do. now? Now I do. Okay. Wonderful. So um, today I want to talk to everyone about um, plant-based. The title is plant-based kidney protection made easy. But I'm going to talk about. I normally talk about pre-dialysis, um, how to keep yourself off of um, dialysis, but. As I began to work in the pre-dialysis space, I noticed like, wow, things that we're doing in dialysis, really, it's not right either. And so I'm going to talk about both. Um, so we're going to today, we're going to carry the um, whole theme of di of um, total health from plant-based nutrition in um, kidney disease. And then we're going to talk about the truth about kidney disease that you may not have heard from your doctor. And um, we'll take a walk through history. I have to walk you through history to explain really why you're not hearing the truth. And, uh, and then we'll talk about different topics with nutrition and kidney disease and simple tips. So things that you can do today. Um, and then also just helping you set your sy system up for success because if we don't do that, then um, you can have the best intentions, but sometimes systems level changes is what really makes a difference. And so why are we talking about whole food, plant-based nutrition? Um, because, and this is one thing that I didn't talk about, but it is um, highly evidence-based. There's long-term overwhelming research. So when Chef AJ was talking to me about like why, um, actually someone at work was just talking to me about this too, about, well, why were you plant, why did you go plant-based? Well, the, the research is overwhelming. It's not um, something that, oh, it's just a great idea. I think a lot of times in nutrition people, there's so many fads and things out there um, that people are like, well, it's just a great idea and that may work for you. But no, the evidence Research shows that this is um, definitely a superior way to eat when it comes to health and then epidemiology even as well. And so what I'm going to do now is just this is a, um, a study because basically I want to give you groundwork. Um, kidney disease really most of the time, there are some genetic reasons why people get kidney disease, like say, for example, polycystic kidneys or IgA nephropathy, something like that. But for the most time, this is something that um, is secondary to like obesity, diabetes, heart disease, high blood pressure. The two main causes of kidney disease in America are diabetes and high blood pressure. Um, it's a silent disease. Many people don't even know that they have it until they land in the ER and their kidneys have failed. So if you are diabetic or high, have high blood pressure, please go get a simple urine screen to see if your kidneys um, have failed or are failing or, or are they working very well. But what I want to tell you is this is a, this is a, um, 
kind of like a meta-analysis that brought together a lot of studies and it was put into a paper called Nutritional Update for Physicians. Why is a plant-based diet so important? So if you look at obesity, this um, paper had 87 published studies and it showed that a vegan or vegetarian diet is highly effective for weight loss and that a vegan diet caused more calories to be burned after meals in contrast to non-vegan diets, which may cause fewer, fewer calories to be burned um, because the food is being stored as fat. Um, diabetes, the Seventh-day Adventists, there's uh, the, the Adventist health studies found that vegetarians have approximately half the risk of having diabetes as non-vegetarians. And then when we look at heart disease, the research is so nailed down in that. If you look at the lifestyle heart trials done by Dean Ornish, 82% of the patients diagnosed with cardiovascular disease in that study um, who followed his program, which is a plant-based program, had some level of regression of atherosclerosis, meaning that the, the fat in the arteries and veins it, it had built up, got better. So what you need to know here, and I'll just stop, and I'm going to go over it a little bit at the end, but I always tell people, patients that I work with, if you're a kidney patient, you're a heart patient, because most over 50% of patients with kidney disease, they actually die of some sort of a cardiovascular event. So that's why you need to know about this. Um, and then high blood pressure in 2010, way back then, the Dietary um, Advisory Guidelines Committee performed a literary review, and they found that vegetarian diets were associated with lower systolic blood pressure and lower diastolic blood pressure. So this overview is just to let you know that all the things that lead up to what might cause someone, the traditional cause of kidney disease, are also improved by a plant-based diet, which um, is why I'm, I'm talking to you about like an overall theme of health. If your kidneys are failing or have failed, that doesn't mean that it's over. You still have a heart, you still have a brain, you still have a liver. So all these things, they still need to be protected. And that's something that we haven't historically um, done in uh, working with kidney patients. So that said, now, does a plant-based diet help those with kidney disease specifically? And you're going to see that, yes, it does. So what, what I'm going to do, and this is going to be kind of the pattern for both pre-dialysis and dialysis, at least here at the first, is we're going to talk about case studies. Then we're going to talk about um, the history. And then we'll go into the current research. Okay, so case studies, three through five. So this is the man I was telling y'all about. So this was an, the first patient I ever worked with. It was pre-dialysis. I started remembering dialysis first. So pre-dialysis, he was 84 years old and he came to me um, and uh, his son, his son found me and um, I told him I felt like I could help him. This was the first one I'd ever worked with and I, I didn't know if it would work. I said, we'll see what happens. So um he had recent symptoms of like nausea, vomiting, poor appetite, which was very common for someone with um, decreased kidney function. And so when he started with me, you'll see there in March, his GFR and what that means, GFR means glomerular filtration rate. So your kidneys filter all the blood in your body. And there's this little ball. It sits like in a in a capsule, the Bowman's capsule, it sits like this in your kidneys and it filters all your blood. It's called the glomerulus. Um, and his filtration rate was only 15. You want that to be greater than 90. So this was 15 is typically where people will start dialysis, 15 or below. He told his doctors, no, I'm not going to start dialysis. I'm going to work with this girl I found. And that happened to be me. And so um, what you'll see here is that his GFR, not only did it stop declining, and we just switched him to a plant-based diet, lowered the protein intake. Um, at that time, we supplemented back with amino acids because I had to bring his protein intake so low. When, they're, when the GFR gets really low, you have to go to a very low protein diet. And so now we have keto analogs, um, which are amino acids, I can go into that in a little bit later, but amino acids that are missing the nitrogen so they don't produce a waste for your kidneys to have to filter. We didn't have those in America back then. So I put him on amino acids and you can see that his GFR jumped up. It got better. It went to 25. And so it kind of, you know, went up and down, which is typical for someone whose um, kidneys have gotten this far along. So there's different stages of kidney disease, one, two, three, four, five, and then five D, which is dialysis. He was stage four. Um, once they get this far along, it's really hard to keep them off dialysis forever, but you can certainly delay. Anyway, so he did eventually fail and go on to dialysis, but we kept him off for 16 months, and that was a pretty big deal. 
So one thing that people will say is, oh, they're going to become malnourished. Well, I know dietitians hate albumin for for nutrition. Um, They say, oh, it's not a good marker of nutrition um, status. But it's better than nothing, and it is what we have. And so um, you can see here that his albumin got better. This tells us two things, is that one, he was not becoming protein malnourished, but it also tells us that the inflammatory state in his body was better. Albumin is a protein in the body that if you get inflamed, it will drop out. And so you can see that his got better. We were we were also decreasing inflammation, which you're going to see later is a really big deal. Um And then this is his creatinine. Oh, no, this is a different picture. Hold on. This is a college kid. So uh, age is not a determinant of who gets kidney disease. Now, this one is pretty interesting because this is an IgA nephropathy. Um, IgA nephropathy is something people are born with. It's not... um, lifestyle related like diabetes or hypertension. Anyway, you'll see that serum creatinine is, is kind of like the GFR. They actually use creatinine to calculate the GFR, but it's a measure of kidney function. And you can, you want it to go low, like you don't want it to be high because if it's too high, that means the kidneys aren't filtering out creatinine. And you can see here that his creatinine dropped. And that was just after two months of working with me, switching to a plant-based diet. Um, This is another uh, cause. This was just a traditional hypertension patient. Um, They had a GFR three. So remember the higher the number, the worse the kidney function um, and went only and went up to a stage two in only two months of following a plant based diet and working with me. So it is I'm answering the question. Does it work for kidney disease? Yes. And here is the final. I will go ahead and beat this um, horse dead, Um, but um, lupus nephritis, another cause of kidney disease. You can see here that the GFR from February to June went from 39 all the way up to 54. And then someone, sometimes they'll say, oh, we don't know what caused the kidney disease. This was an unknown cause, went from 38 to 47 um, in just a couple of months. And so, you know, does nutrition make a difference? Absolutely. And so you may be asking yourself, well, you know, I went to the doctor. Why did they tell me there was nothing I could do? Unfortunately, this is still very prevalent in the nephrology space and it sends me over the edge. And it's the reason I wrote the first book, because doctors will say, well, there's nothing you can do. So we're just going to follow you forward until you land in the dialysis chair. But that's just not true. Um And so uh, let's see, for some reason, my slideshow is not wanting to advance. There we go. Um, So we're going to step into history a little bit and talk about um, why this isn't true and why that uh, maybe that doctors are saying this or maybe just they haven't kind of stepped forward. I have heard that nephrology is a very slow moving um, field of medicine as far as adopting in new ideas. Um, We know that all of healthcare is actually pretty slow moving, but um, this is uh, before there was a dialysis center on every corner. Um, And that was really, you know, it's interesting. Dialysis only became mainstream in 1972. So that is when the Entitlement Act in the United States was passed. Um, we had a con- we had a doctor dialyze a patient on the floor of Congress and was talking about how people needed dialysis. Um, before that, if, if your kidneys failed, you went before what they called a death board. And um, it would say maybe be like a pastor, a businessman, a housewife on the death board. And they would decide there might be five people whose kidneys had failed. If those five people could afford dialysis, only a few could get it because it really wasn't available. So they would pick who got it. In 1972, the Entitlement Act came into play. And then what that did was that made Medicare cover dialysis. So now everyone can get it. Before that, what did we do? Well, guess what? It was diet. Doctors and researchers and physicians, they used diet all the way back. You'll see here, 1918, 1963. Um, Every one of these diets that these doctors used were low in protein and de-emphasized animal protein, all to decrease what we call uremic symptoms, which are symptoms of um, when the toxins, when your kidneys don't filter out toxins, the symptoms that you get from that. And so why did that change? Well, there was this trial called the MDRD trial, which has just haunted the kidney arena. Um, 
It took place 1989 to 1993, and it it showed that low protein diets, supposedly it showed low protein diets produce worse outcomes or inconclusive at best. But the question we have to ask is, did it really? Um, and so if you look at this, there was a lot of problems with this trial. Um, it was based on prescribed protein intake rather than actual protein intake. And if there's any dietitians listening, you know that sometimes we prescribe things and people don't necessarily follow those. Um, it enrolled patients that did not have um, to exhibit evidence of progressive renal failure. So if the, if the, in order for this to really show a difference, you have, it have to know that the kidney disease is progressing. So we can know if it's, if it's going to stop progressing and um, ACE inhibitors sometimes will mask the benefits of diet. And these were used in an unregulated fashion. So if you're doing a research study, you need to get all the confounders and regulate those. And, and ACE inhibitors would be one of those. Um, study B, study group B had no control group. Um, so there was, I, I, you know, I can go on, but basically there was a lot of problems with this, with this trial. And, um, it really has just caused a lot of problems for, for patients with kidney disease. And so, but there's been more recent research. And so I want to talk about those. So Brunori and colleagues looked at elderly patients. They had, um, they were greater than 70 years old. So Dialysis is extremely hard on the elderly. Um, and these, these people had a GFR. Remember, that was a glomerular filtration rate. Remember, my, my patient that I told you about had one of 15. Their GFR was five to seven. They followed these people for 26 and a half months, but they put some on a low protein vegan diet supplemented with keto acids. So those are those amino acids that don't have nitrogen or dialysis without a dietary invention intervention. And what they found was that the death rates between those two groups really weren't that different. And so if you think about someone who is elderly and not that strong anyway, putting them through dialysis is a really hard thing, or you could put them on a low protein vegan diet and supplement that with keto acids and get the same exact results as dialysis. So, um, and then Ree and colleagues also, this is a meta-analysis that they did, and they concluded that a low-protein diet enhances conservative management of non-dialysis-dependent kidney disease um, and should be considered as a potential option for those who want to avoid or defer dialysis initiation or slow down progression of kidney disease. And there's no risk of protein malnutrition. So a lot of times doctors will go, oh, you're going to become protein malnourished. Well, you're not. I showed you that in the case studies if you're followed by a dietitian and it's regulated. Here's what's interesting. People whose kidneys fail, the more animal protein they eat, the more toxic they become because their kidneys can't get rid of all that toxic waste. They lose their appetite anyway because they're so toxic. Why not put them on a low protein plant-based diet and let them keep eating plant proteins? working with a renal dietitian to keep them from becoming malnourished. So, um, but the unfortunate truth for pre-dialysis patients, even in America, is that 48% of people um, never see a registered dietitian and nearly half suggest their doctor never suggested it. Um, most participants, patients agree that um, medical nutrition therapy, that's what dietitians do, is important for slowing the progression of kidney disease. And they were interested in being referred to a dietitian. Um, and they even said, hey, I'll go to another appointment. Kidney patients have a lot of doctor appointments. And that's another thing that the doctors will say, well, they don't want to go to another appointment. But the patient says, Yes, I will. I will go to another appointment if it'll preserve my kidneys. Um, it's interesting that most of the people I work with, the pre-ESRD patients, most of them just came to me. They found me on their own. So, um, all right. So let's move on. So that was pre-dialysis, right? So we already established plant-based nutrition actually is going to slow progression of pre-dialysis. So what about dialysis? You know, the kidneys have failed. So some people say, well, my kidneys have already failed, but you're still a person. You still have other body parts and we want to take care of all those things. And so again, we're going to follow that same pattern. And I'm going to show you um, that indeed it, it does make a difference even for dialysis. So we will look at some case studies here. So this is an end stage renal disease um, male. And he ate a completely vegan diet. 
um, just to kind of give you an idea of what it looked like, fruits, vegetables, nuts, seeds, grains, um, always unrefined. So this wasn't just vegan. It was whole food plant-based, which I like that a little bit better. I like that term a little bit better um, because it talks about, you know, that he avoided refined and processed products, artificial products. He avoided coffee, alcohol, tobacco, all those things. He ate about two meals a day. He was very active. Um, his medications and dialysis were epigen and phosphorus binders, which is very common. Dialysis patients do have to take a lot of medicines, but most of the others he was able to replace. He used herbal formulas and natural means to replace those, which is huge because in dialysis, when you're working in the clinics, once a month, you ask the patients to bring in all their medicines. They will bring in a gallon Ziploc bag loaded down with medicine. And this man only took epigen and phosphate binders, which is pretty amazing. He did in center hemodialysis, uh, three and a half hours per treatment uh, three times a week. And, but he said this, unlike the average person on dialysis after treatment, I was ready to go without all that sluggishness. So if you remember Chef AJ saying that um, the, the people that she took to dialysis, they were just so wiped out after, that is very common. However, this man who was eating a whole food plant-based diet and living a healthy lifestyle didn't give up despite his kidneys had failed. Look at this, he still, he still felt good. So that's a really big deal. Um, these are his labs. So some people will say, oh, but what about um, the phosphorus and the calcium and potassium and all these things? Because when we when you work in dialysis, dialysis, particularly nutritionally, revolves around lab. You know, we give out lab every single month. How's your phosphorus? How's your potassium? Because the kidneys aren't filtering these things out anymore. And so they have to be filtered out when the when the patient comes to dialysis. And so look at his numbers. They're perfect. Um, and people a lot of times are really worried about potassium, which we'll go over later. But his potassium is perfect. And he's eating plants, totally plants. Albumin, look at that. 4.0. Wonderful. Has a low inflammation level and he is not protein malnourished. Okay. The next is an end-stage renal disease female. Um Pretty much the same type of diet, whole food, plant-based. She had, did gentle exercises like yoga. Her only three medications were EPO, um, IV vitamin D. If you don't know that your kidneys, they activate vitamin D in your body. So um, the vitamin D you get from food or from the sun has to be activated and your kidneys do that. And so once the kidneys have failed, then most of the times you have to get, we have to give activated vitamin D. So she was getting that um, and different phosphate binders. Three times a week, initially, she was on dialysis. However, because of her diet um, being completely plant-based, she was able to decrease twice weekly um, because her creatinine level improved so much. So what I tell people is help the dialysis machine. You know, if you're at home in between your dialysis treatments, eating a bunch of junk food and a lot of heavy meat, then the dialysis machine is going to have to clear out a whole lot more toxins than the person who's eating a clean, whole food, plant-based diet. And so again, we'll look at her labs and you'll see that um, her labs were perfect. Everything was right. And look at what her creatinine did, which is really kind of unusual for someone who's already on dialysis. And so now you may be saying, well, gosh, why did my doctor and my dialysis dietitian tell me to eat white bread and meat? So we have to go back to history to figure that out. Um, and so there's some problems with um, the historical dialysis diet. So we're going to look at protein quality, and I have that in quotes, um, the outdated KDOKI guidelines. So KDOKI is kind of the authority in America for like the guidelines as far as what we do for kidney disease nutritionally or, you know, even with medicines, like everything about kidney disease, KDOKI guidelines is really the outline. And then the outdated quote renal diet, which really no longer exists, but again, have its die hard and nephrology. So um, the typical diet for dialysis was a historical heavy, heavy meat focus. Um, and that came from this idea of protein quality. And so where did protein quality come from? Well, the, the first thing you may have heard your dietitian, because I still hear this, it drives me crazy. Well, you need to eat high biological value protein. Um, that is so outdated. It comes from these nitrogen balance studies. Um, so it's an antiquated method of measuring protein quality. It's a, they look at a ratio. Uh, remember, protein is the only macronutrient that contains nitrogen, carbohydrate, protein, and fat. 
protein contains nitrogen and your kidneys have to filter that out. Um, but when we're looking at the, the biological value of protein, they did these nitrogen balance studies and they said, okay, we're going to look at the ratio of retained and absorbed nitrogen content versus that lost uh, according to whichever food we're looking at. Um, and so it comes from nitrogen balance studies. The problem with these studies is that they didn't consider varying calorie intakes. So if someone does not eat enough calories, anybody, you will, the protein that you eat, you'll use that for energy. And so if you don't take that into account when you're doing these studies, then they're really not very good studies. And they even did um, work. A lot of these studies were done in the intensive care units because um, they can use like metabolic carts in there. And there was a 2022 research, um, which is, you know, relevant because it's just a couple of years ago. And um, basically what they said that despite its widespread use in clinical practice, the association between nitrogen balance and the interpretation of protein malnutrition and clinical outcomes in critically ill patients, it remains unclear. Like this is not telling us anything. Um, and then there was another meta-analysis that showed no significant difference in proteins from animal, vegetable, or mixed sources. So really, high biological value and nitrogen balance is, is antiquated and I hope people will let it go. Um, and so there's a one a little bit, a little bit better, but not so much. It's called the um, protein digestibility corrected amino acid score. So we're going to go ahead and talk about that one next. If I can. This is fascinating, by the way. <laughs> I wish that my computer, there we go, would cooperate with me, but we'll keep going along. Uh, okay, so this is this is the protein digestible, that just we'll say PDCAA, because that's a big long thing to say. And thank you, Chef AJ. So this is a little bit of a newer method to measure protein quality, but this is what it does. Okay, so it it measures protein quality on essential amino acid composition, digestibility, and the nutrition requirements of a two to five-year-old child. Um, one is the best possible score and animal proteins typically score higher with the exception of soy. Why? Okay. So if you look at the first, the first measure, essential amino acid composition, it's because they have all of the essential amino acids in those foods. Um, the problem is there's been so much research that's come out since that if you eat a variety of foods, you don't have to have all the amino acids in one food. So that's outdated. The digestibility um, really is not very um, effective either because what they did was they looked to see if the amino acids appeared in the colon to see if it was digestible. Well, the problem is that um, all nutrients are absorbed up higher in the small intestine. So if you really want to know if an amino acid is absorbed, you need to look in the small intestine, which they didn't do. They went below it in the colon. Um, and so that really doesn't work either. And then if you look at the nutrition requirements of a two to five-year-old child, that's the most demanding age of um, human life um, in particular. And these studies were performed 20 years ago with a limited number of children that were recovering from malnutrition. So it's not even really reflective of a traditional two to five year old child. Um, so there is another, another way to measure called DIAS, but nobody really uses that. And so um, what I'm getting at is this, <clears throat> there are major issues with HPV and PDCAA, but that's what is driving this meat focus in dialysis. Both consider single foods and not a mixed diet. And what this leads to in dialysis patients are these over-restricted diets um, where you are so heavily focused on animal protein that you're not getting vitamins and minerals. And it's only part of the picture for dialysis patients. And so... Speaking of nutrition deficiency, um, we're going to have to look at Kato Key Guidelines <clears throat> because this is where 
the historical dialysis diet also came from. Thankfully, these have changed in 2020. They changed the KDOG guidelines. Um, but really, the old ones, again, they forgot the, the whole patient. They forgot that there are still um, other things in the body that need to be preserved, even if the kidneys have failed. There were very, very strict potassium and phosphorus restrictions, which did not consider overall health. Thankfully, those have changed, but it's still so hard to change mindsets. This is not the way a lot of practitioners practice. And so what that leads to, if, if they're not going with the newer Kadoki guidelines, this is the old, the old renal diet. This is what it is. White bread, no whole grains. This is what dietitians would tell patients that came into a dialysis center. No whole grains, only white because they're too high in potassium and phosphorus. Lots of animal protein. You need to eat meat at every meal. No beans, no peas, minimal fruit, only the low potassium fruits, um, no high potassium vegetables, and fiber was never considered. And that is the typical traditional renal diet. Okay, so the old versus the new. So these are the new Kadoki guidelines. So before there was specific recommendations for potassium and phosphorus. Now it is individualized per lab. So if a dialysis patient has a normal potassium, then we don't restrict potassium. We only restrict it unless it goes high. Um, and what does that do? Well, that opens up a whole world of foods, particularly healthy, vitamin-rich, plant-based fruits and vegetables that can make you healthier overall, not just manage your kidney symptoms, but make you a healthier overall person. And so. Now we're going to move forward for better science and better recommendations. All right, so let's move into what we should be doing for both pre and in stage dialysis. And it's going to be different topics of interest. So we're going to go over protein, acid base balance, inflammation, the gut kidney axis, phosphorus, potassium, and cardiovascular disease, because all these things affect people with kidney disease. All right, so if we're talking about protein, Free dialysis, remember, we want to go low protein in dialysis. You do need increased, you do have increased protein needs. And the reason is because when you sit in the dialysis chair, some of the amino acids as your blood goes through the dialysis machine, or if you're doing peritoneal dialysis um, in the dialysate fluid that comes out um, of the peritoneal cavity, um, you do lose protein. So you do have higher protein needs. That doesn't mean you have to get your protein from certain places. Because remember, we talked about that those, those ways of measuring protein are outdated. So pre-dialysis, think low protein source from plants, sometimes very low protein supplemented back with keto analogs. If you're at that sometimes point, I highly recommend you work with the dietitian skilled in that because it is, there's a lot to that. Um, and you can get keto analogs now in America. Um, so low protein for pre-dialysis, why? Because you're going to decrease that nitrogen waste, you're going to lessen the kidney load, and you're going to lower the intraglomerular pressure. So that pressure inside that little glomerulus that sits in the ball, when you eat animal protein, it increases that pressure. You don't want that. You're trying to preserve that. <clears throat> Okay, so this is just a really cool study. Um, and I like to cite this because it says, for every 33% increase of plant protein in a CKD, that's pre-dialysis patient's diet, a 23% lower risk of mortality ensues. Why? Because again, we're looking at the whole patient. We're protecting your heart. We're protecting your arteries and veins. We're protecting your liver. All of those things, rather than just only focusing on the kidneys. And then if you take a, think about the, the type of protein, What's in the package? That's what I like to say. So plant-based, what comes in that package? Zero cholesterol, no saturated fats unless you're using tropical oils. It's very alkaline, full of antioxidants, full of fiber, less uremic toxic waste that your kidneys have to filter out. The phosphorus is very poorly absorbed, which is a great thing for kidney patients. And there's no additives if you're eating whole foods. Animal base, what does it come with? It's loaded with cholesterol, saturated fat. It's extremely acidotic in the body. It's void of antioxidants. There is no fiber. It produces high uremic waste. The phosphorus is way better absorbed. And most of the time, animal protein is injected with potassium and phosphorus additives. So you think, oh, well, I'm not eating these high potassium, high phosphorus plant foods, but you're eating additives, which are almost 100% absorbed. What about dialysis? 
Um, can we meet the protein needs with plants? So remember, we talked about that as long as you eat a varied diet, all those other ways of, of determining if protein is the best or not is outdated. Um, and so, but if you look at this, this is looking particularly at dialysis um, patients and protein. And so this is a mini review of plant-based diets in, on hemodialysis. Um, so they reviewed vegetarian dialysis patients and the protein was still high. It was 1.2 to 1.25 grams per kilogram of protein per day, um, which, which you need if you're on dialysis. You do need higher protein intake. But um, they were able to achieve that with plant-based proteins with no signs of undernutrition. And it's, what they came away with was that amino acid variability is trivial as long as calorie needs are met and the diet has variety. So we saw that in the case study. Now we're seeing it backed by research and science that yes, you can be a dialysis patient on a plant-based diet and be healthy. Um, and so this is another study. This looked at 19 vegetarian to 299 non-vegetarian, which tells you what um, most people eat on dialysis, but they looked at different things that would measure malnutrition, because this is a lot of reasons why doctors or dietitians will say, oh, you're going to become malnourished if you eat a, a vegetarian diet on dialysis. But if you look at this, that's not the case. I mean, the, the numbers vary. The vegetarian is a little bit lower, but it's not out of range and it's barely lower. The potassium is slightly higher higher, but it's not out of range. It's fine. Phosphorus is lower. Phosphorus is the hardest thing to control in a dialysis patient because phosphorus is in everything. It's highly absorbed and the dialysis machine can't remove it. So if you're listening and you're a dialysis patient, you know that if your dietitian comes around and talks to you often, often they'll say your phosphorus is too high. You need to take your phosphate binders. You need to change your diet. Well, look at this. The plant-based diet actually will lower it. Um, calcium is fine and parathyroid hormone is fine. So yes, it is safe. And then this is um, by one of my favorite physicians, um, Liebman and Joshi. Joshi actually wrote the foreword to my second book. I just absolutely love him, but he is a plant-based nephrologist. And um, he did a study, this is on peritoneal dialysis patients. So peritoneal dialysis patients, they lose more protein even than a hemodialysis patient, but they looked at 844 PDE patients. And um, the ones that had the highest tertiary protein from plants had higher albumin levels despite lower protein intake. And so they had to explain this, like, why is this? Because people don't get that. Um, but what happened was that the average albumin loss across the, the peritoneal membrane is about five to eight grams per day. Okay. But normally this would be compromised, this would be compensated. So if, if, if we lost five to eight grams of protein, say someone not on dialysis, the liver would compensate by making albumin unless the person had some sort of inflammation going on in their body or they were acidotic. Acidosis is something I look at in all my patients and we'll talk about that. But when someone is eating a lot of animal protein, that is very acidotic. It is very inflammatory. If they're not eating that, those things are down. And so um, the liver will synthesize more albumin if you're not inflamed. And so the, benefit, the benefits of a decreased inflammation and acidosis compensated for the lower protein intake. So it makes sense. All right, now we're on to acid-base balance because I said I would talk about this. So um, what do we need to know about acid-base balance? So how do the kidneys maintain acid-base balance? So the kidneys secrete <coughs> hydrogen ions in the urine and reabsorb bicarbonate back. So bicarbonate is um, alkaline. If your GFR, your glomerular filtration rate, remember we said that we want that to be 90 or greater. Once it hits about 40 or 50, that's about a stage three, you're going to start having problems with acid-base balance. Pre-dialysis, it is so nailed down that you want a plant-based diet um, because it is very alkalizing. If I have someone eating a plant-based diet and they're still a little bit, I look at certain lab values and I can tell if they're a little bit acidotic, they're still a little bit acidotic. I can remedy that really easy by putting a little bit of baking soda in water every day and it completely resolves the problem. Um, and dialysis is a little bit more complicated because the kidneys have already failed, but 
they do put that bicarbonate in the dialysis machine, but we hardly ever talk about, well, what could you do with your diet? Remember to make the dialysis machine's job a little bit easier. And so we'll talk about that. Why is acidosis such a big deal? Well, in both, in both areas, pre-ESRD and dialysis, it causes a degradation of muscle protein and muscle wasting, which you definitely do not want. Destruction of bones and bone disease. Um, kidney patients are already at risk for bone disease because remember, we have to activate vitamin D and vitamin D has everything to do with the bones. And if, you're not, if your kidneys aren't doing that, you're already at risk. Decreased albumin synthesis, which we've talked about. If you're a pre-ESRD patient, acidosis is going to cause you to progress to end-stage renal disease faster. It's going to stimulate in inflammation and impair insulin um, responsiveness. None of those things we want. And so how do we know then? How do we know, is my diet producing an acid environment in my body or an alkaline environment in my body? And we know that by something called potential renal acid load. Okay, so I'm going to explain this. Every food has a potential renal acid load, and it's different than what you may think. So if you think about a lemon outside of the body, a lemon seems very acidic, right? But when you take it inside the body, it's very alkaline. It has a low potential renal acid load. Animal protein has a very high potential renal acid load. You don't want a high acid load because you're making your kidneys work harder. If kidneys perform acid-based balance, you want that to be an easy job. So when you're eating a ton of animal protein, you're making that hard on the kidneys. You're driving them further in the ground. If you have an old car, you don't want to drive that car from Mississippi to California. You want to go get a rental car and drive it because you don't want to drive that car in the ground. Well, if your kidneys are struggling, lessen the load eat less acidotic foods. And so here, if you look at the, um, this is the potential renal acid load um, of specific foods. And if you look, you want the number to be low. So if you look at fruits and vegetables, they have a negative number. They don't produce an acid environment. But as you go, look at all the animal protein. It gets higher and higher and higher. And so this, that's another reason that you're going to want to avoid animal protein, both pre-dialysis and dialysis. And so um, why does this matter? Um, because protein is the principal source of acid generation in the diet. And um, not only that, okay, so not only do the kidneys have to do all this acid-based balance, um, but another problem is that when you eat an acid-forming diet, you're going to increase certain enzymes, I mean, hormones like angiotensin II, aldosterone, and endothelin. And these are going to drive your kidneys in the ground um, as well as just the acid state. Um, short term, these hormones will help excrete acid, but long term, they're going to actually worsen your kidney function. What about dialysis patients? So, <clears throat> again, the same thing protein um, catabolism, uh, loss of muscle mass. Um, you're going to have a net efflux, meaning that calcium will leave the bone. Okay, why is this a big deal for dialysis patients? Because when kidneys, and this is a big convoluted thing, I'm going to try to make it real simple, but kidneys with the vitamin D, they also excrete phosphorus. They also, the vitamin D helps manage calcium in the body. All this stuff gets out of whack when the kidneys fail. Um, if you get too much calcium and phosphorus in the blood, which happens with kidney disease, those two things make bone. And then a kidney patient will begin to lay down bone cells all over their body. I'm talking in your heart, in your arteries, in your veins. So this is another reason that a lot of kidney patients die of cardiovascular disease and not necessarily, quote, kidney disease, because they have now laid down bone cells in areas they don't want bone cells. Acidosis speeds that process forward. Um, also, calcium is a positive inotrope. What does that mean? That means that calcium makes your, can make your heart beat faster if it gets too high, which is another reason if you're a kidney patient, you're a heart patient. Um, and so even on dialysis, it's a big deal to make sure that we're not acidotic. So in dialysis, bicarbonate is put into the dialysis machine. So theoretically, this should be individualized per person. So if you've never been in a dialysis center, it's a big open room. If, you, if you're doing in-center hemodialysis and the patients are sitting in chairs all around the room, most of the time this bicarbonate is on the loop, what we call is the fluid that comes behind the machines that 
that puts it into every single machine. So it is not individualized most of the time. Sometimes it is. It, it varies from country to country and dialysis center to dialysis center. Um, but we really need more research on this. Um, this is an argument if you are a kidney patient for home therapies because you can individualize your bicarbonate. It's also an argument for diet to eat a more alkaline diet, which we just showed you as a plant-based diet. Um, and so I'm going to ask you, if you're a dialysis patient, help your dialysis machine. Quit making it so hard on your dialysis machine and your body. Okay, moving on to inflammation. So inflammation is a really big deal. Um, I do a whole, I present for a company, I'm a speaker for a company called Kate Farms, which is a, um, it's a plant-based like tube feeding company. Um, and they came out with a new product called Reno 1.8. And my presentation for them is all about inflammation on dialysis because it's that big of a deal. And so um, what is this? What is inflammation? So I love this little slide. I use it all the time. But if you think about um, inflammation, it's it's oxidation. So if you think about if you cut an apple and leave it out, it starts to turn brown. That's oxidation, similar to inflammation inside the human body. So basically you're browning. Why is this happening? Because in the body, there are things called free radicals or oxidants. What is that? It's missing an electron in the outer shell. You got to go back to science. But an antioxidant that helps this mean, angry oxidant in the middle comes in and says, hey, I got an extra electron. You can have mine. And so it stops this inflammation process that if we don't stop it, continues. It, it'll take an electron from the next atom and then from the next one and the next one on down to where it will damage DNA in the long run. Um, and so inflammation pre-dialysis is a big, huge deal because um, as kidney disease worsens, inflammation worsens and oxidative stress worsens. And then you have all this premature aging, kidney fibrosis, that's kidney scarring. And when you have kidney scarring, then the kidneys are going to continue to get worse and worse and worse. So it's going to increase the progression of your kidney disease. Um, but it also it contributes to other things, things like malnutrition, um, that coronary artery calcification, what I was talking about, where the body's making bone and laying it down in the arteries and veins, atherosclerosis, insulin resistance, all these things that you don't want. You just don't want inflammation in your body. And really that goes for everybody, every single person on the planet. You want to eat an anti-inflammatory diet, whether your kidneys work or not. Um, but in dialysis, kidney um, inflammation is something that we hardly ever talk about, but it is a strong prognosticator of sudden death. Well, if we're going to dialysis to stay alive, then we should be talking about something that that is going to um, predict death. And that the phenomenon of inflammation persists and remains this like unaddressed need and topic. So that's why I talk about it. Um and so what why is dialysis so inflammatory? Well, dialysis in and of itself is inflammatory. If you look here in the top right, that is a that's a dialysis membrane. So if and when someone comes to sit in the chair to do in center hemodialysis, if this this little piece is on the machine and all the blood goes through there, and that's how it's cleaned. Um, and so that is basically like a foreign, your blood is going through a foreign object. Um, a central venous catheter. This is why it is so important for you if you have diabetes or hypertension, to go get your kidneys checked every single year. Because if you land in the hospital um, in renal failure, you have to have one of these catheters. And they're very dangerous. If you look at the picture, I don't know if you can see it, but the little white tube, it goes through the neck and all the way straight into the heart. They're uber inflammatory. Um, dialysis centers try to get those out as quickly as possible. Certain medications are very inflammatory for dialysis patients. And then we'll talk about middle and large protein bound molecules. And so when we're talking about uremic toxins that your kidneys should filter, and we're talking about um, the inflammatory state in dialysis, the dialysis machine is there to, it's there to get fluid off and to remove toxins. Um, and so the main toxins like urea, creatinine, does a great job. The middle and large molecules, these are things that are produced from inflammation. They're called cytokines. The dialysis machine is not going to remove those. So they're still in your body. 
So we have to do something different because we know the dialysis machine is not going to remove it. And then protein bound molecules. These are things that come from the gut. Um, we're pretty sure the research is still out there, but we're pretty sure that the dialysis machine is not going to remove those. And so we've talked about what inflammation is, and we've talked about that the dialysis machine doesn't move it. How are you going to know? Well, you can look at your lab work. Your dietitian is going to give you lab work every single month, and you're going to know. Um, and so I'm going to go through some of that lab work. So if you get your lab work and your albumin is low, your hemoglobin is low, your transparent saturation is low, but your ferritin is really high, what's going on? You're inflamed. Why is that? Because albumin is called an acute phase protein. Your liver makes it. But in the presence of inflammation, your liver says, you know what? We have to make these inflammatory proteins, these cytokines, because we're inflamed. So I'm going to stop making albumin and I'm going to start making something else. That's why your albumin goes low. Why does your hemoglobin and transferrin saturation go low? In your body, you have iron that floats around in your blood. And you have iron that's in storage in the cells. When you're inflamed, there is something, well, when you're not inflamed, there's something called ferroportin. It's a transmembrane protein. So it says, iron, you can leave and go anywhere. I'm ferroportin. I open the door. Hepcidin comes in if there's inflammation and says, ferroportin, your job is over. We're inflamed. I'm locking everything up. So I say hepcidin is a security guard that says, no more. Iron has to come back in storage. Okay. So transferrin tells us the iron that's floating around that ferroportin let out. Well, we're inflamed. That iron's not floating around. Where is it? It's in ferritin in storage because hepcidin said you've got to keep it locked up. So if you look at your labs and they look like this, you're going to know, hey, I'm inflamed and I probably should do something about it. And so what are we going to do? Well, we know that the dialysis machine is not going to remove those inflammatory cytokines. So we're going to go back to diet. We're going to help that dialysis machine. Remember, the typical diet for dialysis is very void in nutrients. Um, and the typical instruction for dialysis is very void. <clears throat> so let's change that. We're going to eat antioxidants. We're going to eat fiber. And we're going to help your body make antioxidants. How do you know if a food has antioxidants? Well, you can look at something called an ORAC scale. This is called the Oxygen Radical Absorbency Capacity Scale. It tells us the total antioxidant capacity of food. So basically, they take a food, they put it in a, in a test tube, and they put something that would cause oxidation, and then they put in a food that would block the oxidation and see how well does that work. And then they give it a score. So like if you look, for instance, acai berry, has a really high antioxidant capacity. All the fruits and vegetables are super high. I want you to go down to oregano. Look at oregano. This is fascinating to me. Spices are so high in antioxidants. Things like oregano, basil, um, sumac is a new spice I found, um, curcumin that's in turmeric, um, all the cinnamon, all of these spices are so high in antioxidants. Okay. So as a dialysis patient or as a kidney patient, you've been told, Hey, you need to limit your salt. Okay. That's great. We're going to kill two birds with one stem right here. We're going to use dried spices to make your food taste delicious. And while doing it, we're going to boost the ORAC value of your food. All right. Guess what? Your body can also make antioxidants, but um, you have to eat certain foods to do that. And so the antioxidants that your body makes are things like glutathione peroxidase, superoxide dismutase, and catalase. And then these are kind of the, the minerals needed to make those antioxidants. Um, and so... If you are working with kidney patients or you are a kidney patient, you don't necessarily have to know, like, remember those um, endogenous antioxidants. But what you do need to know is the foods that you need to eat to make endogenous antioxidants. And once again, we're right back to plant based foods, um, particularly like cruciferous vegetables and onions and fruits and spices and things like that. All right. What about the gut? What does the gut have to do with kidney disease? You're probably thinking, why are we talking about the gut when we're talking about kidneys? But the gut has a lot to do with kidney disease, actually. So um, we know that there's different things about the gut. And you probably, you know, the gut, I know, is a big, huge deal nowadays in, in science. But um, we, we feel like that um, 
in kidney disease that a kidney patient's um, gut, particularly dialysis patients' gut, looks more like the picture on the right than on the left. And the reason we know this is because of research done with congestive heart failure. So a congestive heart failure patient, they hold fluid. A dialysis patient holds fluid because the kidneys aren't getting rid of it. A congestive heart failure patient, sometimes they can become distended. So can dialysis patients, their belly can become distended. And that, that lining of your gut can become separated like the picture on the right, which you don't want. Because when that happens, you can see the bacteria in the gut will leave and go all over the body and cause an inflammatory state. Interestingly, here's another thing. The diet, when the diet is void of fiber, these bacteria like to eat fiber, okay? If the diet is void of fiber, which the traditional dialysis diet has been, they will eat mucus if needed. And there's a mucosal lining inside your gut that if the bacteria eat that away, again, they can escape. And we don't want that. Fiber is so important for dialysis patients and it's hardly ever talked about. Um, the historical education is low fiber, um, but a lack of fiber creates an inflammatory environment because it creates a shortage of short chain fatty acids. So um, short chain fatty acids are byproducts of dietary fiber metabolism, um, and these have anti-inflammatory properties. Um, there's also an increase of secondary bile acids. So secondary bile acids are things like um, deoxycholic acid or like lethicholic acid, and these are very inflammatory. So we don't want these things. So, and then the, the problem, a lot of the problems with the gut kidney axis is like certain medications, the low fiber diet, but also high animal protein. Whenever you eat something, Whatever you eat, whatever you feed your body will also feed your gut. And whatever you feed your gut, the bacteria in there are going to produce byproducts called metabolites, okay? If you eat a plant-based diet, you're going to produce different metabolites than if you eat an animal-based diet. If you eat an animal-based diet, you're going to produce metabolites that are kidney toxins. One of those is called trimethylamine and oxide. You can just say TMAO. Pcresyl sulfate and endoxyl sulfate. These are things you don't want because pre-dialysis, they're going to cause your kidneys to decline faster. And then um, once you're on dialysis, it's just more toxins that the dialysis machine has to get rid of. And so you don't want these things. Um, so TMAO, again, is made in the gut, but it's cleared by the kidneys. Um, so you don't want the kidneys to have to do more work. It is a kidney toxin. It also increases the risk of heart disease. And remember, if you're a kidney patient, you're a heart patient. P-crystal sulfate and endoxyl sulfate really is also just a kidney toxin. Um, they increase overall mortality and cardiovascular risk. Here again, plant-based diets decrease these, uh, the production of these by as much as 60%. So yet another reason to eat a plant-based diet if you're a kidney patient. Okay, moving on to bone mineral metabolism. What is phosphorus? We've talked a little bit about that. It's the second most abundant mineral in the body. Um, it's not something negative, even though we talk about it negative a lot with kidney patients. Um, it is needed for bones, teeth, and cell membranes. Um, it, it, but your body wants to keep calcium and phosphorus in balance. And remember, if those get out of balance, you begin to lay down bone all over your body. Why should you care? For that reason, if you're a dialysis patient, if you're a pre-dialysis patient, high phosphorus levels can lead to faster progression of kidney disease, which, you, which we're trying to avoid. So plant-based diets, once again, they're gonna help with phosphorus. Uh, plant-based phosphorus is bound to phytate. Our bodies do not express the enzyme phytase to be able to break that down. So only about 10 to 20% is absorbed. Whereas animal-based proteins, um, about 40 to 60% is absorbed just naturally in an animal-based protein. But the problem is animal-based proteins are, are injected with phosphorus additives. So those are about 90% absorbed. Serum phosphate levels in... Um, we're significantly lower in vegetarian patients versus non-vegetarian patients on hemodialysis. So if you're on hemodialysis and your dietitian keeps talking to you about you have too high phosphorus levels, maybe you could eat a plant-based diet. We've talked about this, that we have changed the recommendations now in the Cato key guidelines. Um, this is something, this is fiber, fiber blast growth factor um, 23. 
this is, it is a phosphatoric hormone. So if you're a pre-dialysis patient, you may not see your phosphorus go high. The reason is because in the background, this FGF23 is going up and it's making you urinate out your phosphorus. But this will cause cardiovascular disease. Your doctor's never going to draw this lab. So you won't know, but it is there. And if you keep your phosphorus intake down, then you won't have to worry about that. Oops. All right. The one legitimate concern is potassium because potassium can be pretty dangerous. If the potassium gets too high or too low, it can cause uh, sudden cardiac death. However, the focus has been in the wrong place. So this was a study um, done by Dr. Kavetsky, who's actually here in Memphis, and Cam Kalantar, who's a, another nephrologist that's really big in nutrition. But um, they looked at the top 10 sources of potassium um, in hemodialysis patients. And if you look here on the right, the list is beef, chicken, Mexican food, hamburgers. Then you get down to legumes and fresh fruits. So all those things came first, probably because of the potassium additives. Um, this is just a slide showing the difference that it's, it's really not that different when it comes to potassium in plant um, versus animal food. And the, and the thing is, in plant food, because you've got fiber, again, you're not going to absorb the potassium as well as you would in an animal-based food that's fiber void. The other thing is with potassium, everybody runs to diet first, but that's not necessarily, it's not always diet. There's so many causes of high potassium levels besides diet, like acidosis, which we talked about already, um, high blood glucose. If you're an uncontrolled diabetic, um, those two things cause the potassium that's inside. If the potassium likes to be inside the cell, it is an intracellular mineral. But when you become acidotic, or your blood glucose gets high, it causes that potassium to leave and go from inside the cell to the blood. So now you have high blood potassium levels. Um, things like chronic constipation, you can reabsorb potassium. Um, if you eat a high fiber diet, you may not have that. GI bleed, blood transfusion, which dialysis patients sometimes do get blood transfusions. And we talked about that. There are a few cautions. If you are a dialysis patient and um, or or a late stage kidney patient that's struggling, that's having high potassium levels, the best idea may not be smoothies and juices. Smoothies are a little bit better than juices. And for the general population, I'm all about smoothies and juices. But for kidney disease, sometimes when you grind the fiber cell, it makes that potassium a little bit more bioavailable, which would be a great thing if you aren't a kidney patient. But if you are, you don't necessarily want more bioavailability when it comes to potassium. Also, never, ever, ever use a salt substitute if you're a kidney patient because those are extremely high in potassium. And then again, we talked about how the KDOP guidelines now go for looking at the lab and not necessarily a blanket potassium restriction. And then just one little touch on heart disease. I'm going to say it again if you're a kidney patient, you're a heart patient, but... Um, Cardiovascular mortality, like I said, accounts for about 40 to 50 percent of deaths in patients um, with advanced kidney disease. And so we know it's it's nailed down that um, plant based diets are better for cardiovascular disease. So um, plant based diets, hypertension, we limit salt. Plant based diets are less hypertensive. Um, we have improved insulin resistance on plant-based diets, and um, the low-fat plant-based diet is the only diet shown to reverse plaque in both arteries and veins. And then you have those non-traditional causes of cardiovascular disease, which would be like the high potassium levels. Um, the calcifications, inflammation, and anemia. Um, we didn't talk a lot about anemia, but that's a whole other talk for another day. But those first three that we talked about, again, the plant-based diet fixes all this. So what are we going to do? Practical tips to wrap this up. <clears throat> if you're running a high potassium level, just eat lower potassium fruits and vegetables, things like strawberries, cabbage, apples, broccoli, carrots. There's tons of them. Just stick with the lower potassium ones, but don't give up on a plant-based diet. If you're eating out, these are some of my favorite um, 
ways to teach people to eat out. We talked about the Happy Cow app, how if you go to Mississippi Delta, it's not going to show you anything. But in most places, if you'll put this app on your phone, it'll show you everything around you that's plant-based. Um, sometimes, believe it or not, the, I have Logan's Roadhouse on here. That's a steakhouse. But if, if I'm in a bind, if I'm somewhere and there's a steakhouse, I'll go there because what I'll do is I'll order the side. Like you can get steamed broccoli and a baked potato at a steakhouse. Um, any kind of deli, a lot of the ethnic foods, like Mexican food, you can get beans and, um, you know, um, veggie fajitas is what I usually get. So things like that. Plan. Um, if you if you don't set your system up for success, you can have the best intentions and it won't happen. How do you do that? Meal plan on the weekends. Every weekend, I eat every day for lunch. I'm kind of like Chef AJ. I eat the same thing every day. And people, I'm kind of known for eating this big monstrous salad every day for lunch. But I make five of those on Sunday night. So that during the week, I just pull out one every day. I set my system up for success. Um, know what you're going to have that week and grocery shop towards that meal, towards those meal plans. Um, have healthy food available all the time if you're on dialysis and if it's permitted. I know some dialysis centers will not allow you to bring food, but if it's permitted, bring your food, bring healthy food to dialysis. Um, even if your peers sitting around you are not eating healthy food, you can teach them. So this is my newest book, just bringing it all to a close. This was the one I wrote for patients because the first one I wrote uh, was really for practitioners to raise awareness, which I guess would trickle down to the patient. But patients wanted um, more. They wanted recipes and they wanted um, not not long chapters. And so that's exactly what this is. It's short chapters, short recipes, easy to cook items. If you um are a chef and you love to cook, you can feel free to add to the recipes, but I tried to make it for people who are not cooks. Um, this is that eight-week program. So I originally wrote this because people that are pre, this is for pre-dialysis patients. Um, so people that are pre-dialysis, many times they, their insurance won't cover a dietitian or the dietitian doesn't take insurance because it's super hard to bill um, for nutritional interventions. Um, and they just can't afford it. I mean, it's just too expensive. And so I said, you know what? Everybody deserves to have nutrition education if they have kidney disease. And so I created this. So it's an affordable eight-week program. And um, this has recently changed. Since I went to Guatemala, everything that I get from this, I'm going to use towards the work in Guatemala. Um, so not only will you help yourself, you may help someone in Guatemala as well. And then if you want to contact me, this is my website and um, I'm on Instagram and there's my email. I'd love to hear from you. And so in summary, um, plant-based nutrition is appropriate and beneficial for all stages of kidney disease, including dialysis. Um, for pre-dialysis, it slows progression. For dialysis, it's going to improve your wellness. It's going to reduce um, comorbidity risk and overall mortality. Um, in all stages of um, kidney disease, plant-based nutrition is preferred for acid-based balance, lowering inflammation, for gut health, phosphorus control, and cardiovascular risk. And in all stages, protein needs can be met with plants and potassium can be controlled. So, and then I'll show you, this is just the references for this presentation and I will stop sharing my screen. And wow, I know there was a are... lot of information, but I hope that was amazing. That was yeah, amazing. I hope it like answers all the questions if you're a kidney patient. Well, so. You know, are you, you uh, do you give this at medical conferences? Because if not, you definitely should. Well, I do. I, I do speak a lot. Most of the time, I, I do speak, like I said, for that company, Cape Farms. And then uh, most of the time I'll speak to like council and renal nutrition groups across the nation. But I would love to speak at a medical conference because really doctors need to know that there is, you know, these changes that, that we, that I showed you in these patients, there was no medication change at all. It was strictly diet that brought those GFRs up to where it did. So um, they need to know and refer people out to dietitians. I mean, that that's incredible because you mentioned you, a plant-based nef nephrologist. I think you said Joshi? Shivam Joshi. He's out of New York. Yes. Joshi. That's mm -hmm. incredible. I mean, mm -hmm. I did not, I, I've heard of a plant-based nephrologist uh, in California, Kaiser named Dr. Sean Hashmi. So it's amazing that yes. there's another one, but you know, it's not only that the plant-based diet is, it's not recommended for kidney disease, but there are still people that think it's detrimental. Yes. There's also Dr. Balani down in Florida. He's a 
I believe he's plant-based nephro on Instagram, but he's pretty awesome too. Well, I'm so glad that there's, there's, there's being more met more of them right now. I'm writing this down. They'll be fantastic guests on the show. Why are you so passionate about kidney disease? <laughs> you know what? That's such a funny question. Okay. So when I graduated from Vanderbilt and I, I was doing that summer relief job in Nashville and my sister was living in Memphis at the time. And this company that, that got bought out and I learned it was this called renal care group reached out to me and said, Hey, we want you to come interview to be our dietitian. And I was like, I know I don't want to do that. I said, but I'll go and I'll stay with my sister and I'll just practice interviewing. And so I went down there and I interviewed for this dialysis job and I was like, you know what? I think I want to do that. And so I did. And I had no idea that this would be my life's work, but you know, sometimes we get called to things that we don't think we would ever do. I mean, if you had told me when I was 16, you're going to work with kidney disease, I would have been like, okay, yeah, I'm not. But, um, you know, I, I guess I just, I tell people that, you know, I, I guess I just feel like I just saw a whole huge group of people um, that were largely forgotten um, by the medical field. And also that, uh, there's so much you can do where you don't have to land in the dialysis chair and nothing's being done. And somehow I just decided I was going to beat that drum and here I am doing it. So, um, you know, hopefully it, things are getting better, but I, I'd like to just see them continue to get better. Yeah. Well, well, we are clearly passionate about it. So thank you for your work and for your volunteer work in, in Guatemala. You showed pictures of your salad. Tell us a little bit about what's in it, what kind of dressing you use and what do you do for the other meals? Okay. Um, okay. So yeah, every day my kids say, mom, you eat a bucket of salad. And I'm like, yes, I do. It's huge. So I put, I put um, all different kinds of greens in there. And then I will get, um, you know, other vegetables like carrots and tomatoes. And um, I try to do something different every week, but usually I'll get a stir fry kit. You know, you can get the fresh stir fry kit at the grocery store, but I don't stir fry it. I eat it raw. I put it in my salads because there's all sorts of different varieties of vegetables in that. Um, I'll sometimes I'll put bok choy in there. I'll put like raw asparagus, raw squash. I mean, I go all out radishes, everything. And then I'll put, um, I love roasted chickpeas. I put those in there every time. Um, I love nutritional yeast. I put that in there. Um, there are these things. It's, it's these, um, they're kind of like, I don't know if you've ever heard of soy curls. Yeah, have you ever heard of them? Of, yes, yes. Oh my God, they're so delicious. But there's this other one that's a little bit different. It's like a soy curl. It's just called plant protein and, and you have to like rehydrate it, but they are so good. So I'll cook those and put those in there. And then, um, for my dressings, I do several different dressings. I'll do like a balsamic um, or I had um, certain recipes. They're actually in the book, but um, one is like an or I take mandarin oranges and I'll put those with um, like rice vinegar and tamari, you know, kind of Asian type spices, blend all that up. Um, and then that'll be a salad dressing. And then I have another cilantro dressing, um, kind of similar. I put the whole head of cilantro in there, stems and all, um, with like garlic and tamari and, um, gosh, what else is in there? I use a lot of this, um, it's called imagine no chicken broth. It's like a, it's like a chicken broth, but no chicken It's a vegan chicken broth. Um, I'll put that in there, blend all that up. Um, so it just depends on the week, but I do lots of, you know, I make my own salad dressings. Um, and I'll put those in there. And yeah, that's what I eat every single day for lunch. Nice. What about the other meals? Um, so at night, uh, well, breakfast, I'll usually do um, some sort of a green drink, like a green smoothie or a green juice or something like that. Um, I love oatmeal. Oatmeal doesn't love me for some reason. So I, the green smoothies love me better. Um, so I'll do that. And then, uh, and with those, I'll put like, again, tons of greens and I'll even put like, if you buy broccoli, um, like with the head and the stem, don't throw the stem away. There's so many nutrients in the stem. So I'll chop up the stem and blend it up in the blender and drink it in my green smoothie. Never know it's there. Um, but it's so loaded in nutrients. And then, uh, so I do that in the morning and then in dinner, it just depends, you know, we'll do things I cook for my family. And so, and I have four kids, so, um, two are, are gone, but I still have the other two around. Um, and, and the other two are, are back sometimes, but they're, they're in college and living their lives. Um, but I'll do things like, um, we call it Southern night. So guess what? Southern food 
can be vegan. In fact, if you don't, okay, so I tell people, quit throwing ham hock and fat back in your beans. Um, that's what they do in the South. They love to throw some bacon up in the beans. Quit doing that. Um, I use these, it's called um, No Chicken bouillon cubes and it makes them delicious and so I'll do things like black eyed peas or uh, maybe lima beans and then you can do mashed potatoes and sweet potatoes um, and then like turnip greens or green beans um, in the summer in the south we eat this salad it's got um, tomatoes and cucumbers and peppers I mean I'm not tomatoes cucumbers and onions and then you put them in this vinegar and we eat that and uh, fresh peaches. So that's kind of my Southern meal that doesn't have to have meat. I'm going to throw fried chicken in that. Just eat the vegetables. Um, I'll do Italian night where we'll have like, um, I'll do like uh, some sort of pasta with a marinara sauce um, or something like that. We do Mexican night, uh, which is easy to make plant-based. Um, what else? Oh, we do a lot of bowls, like veggie bowls. So like a rice base and then like um, maybe um, like some sort of bean and then I'll roast beets in the oven and put those on the top, things like that. Oh, and we eat berries almost every single solitary night. So I'll put like blueberries, strawberries, raspberries and blackberries in a bowl and we eat those because they're so high in antioxidants. That sounds fantastic. Do you exercise every day? I do. What do you do? <laughs> I do. Um, I love exercise. So we have a Peloton. Um, so I'll, I'll do the Peloton a lot. I have this dog. He's an Aussie doodle named Daryl, who I absolutely love. Um, he's probably, I know he's on my Facebook page. My kids say I love him more than I love them. Um, but I'll walk Daryl. I have to walk Daryl every single day. He will not accept me not walking him every single day. So I'll walk Daryl. I lift weights. I do yoga, um, all those sorts of things. That's Daryl is such a cute name for a dog. <laughs> and he looks like a Daryl too. He's adorable. That's so cute. You know, somebody actually sent in a question in advance, if you can answer it. And there's a few in the chat I've been seeing. Uh, but Alyssa said that I have consistently have had low sodium levels of 132 MMOL over L on my CMP lab work. Is this a concern? My nurse practitioner said to eat 1500 milligrams of salt a day, but I try to limit salt as I eat whole food plant-based. Mm hmm I don't think it's a big, not, not that level. I mean, if it was lower than that, it would be a concern. Mine runs low too, because I also don't eat salt because of my family history of cardiovascular disease and I don't want high blood pressure. So mine will run low. I also drink a gallon of water every single day. So that can make your, your, so it can dilute out your sodium levels a little bit. Um, at that level, I wouldn't worry so much about it unless you feel bad, unless you're like cramping or something like that. Um, but you could add, you know, even if you just add just a little bit of salt, you know, you could do that to try to bring it up, but unless it's dropping lower than that, I've never had problems. And um, so I think 132 is not, is not super low. Great. Thank you. I saw some questions in the chat. Guys, it helps when you put four question marks because it goes really fast. Where did it go? If you have Daryl nearby, we'd love to see him. I just think that's okay. <laughs> I can um, text one of my kids and tell him to let Daryl in. <laughs> Maybe he can make a cameo at the end. A uh, honeybee asks, does the body give clues that it's laying down calcium all over the body or is there a test? Um, okay. If you are a kidney patient, um, <clears throat> your labs will be drawn every single month. If you're if you're a dialysis patient, that's where this really comes into play for the most part. Labs will be drawn every single month. If your parathyroid hormone is high, your phosphorus is high, and your calcium is high, you can be certain you're laying down calcium all over your body. Another thing is don't take calcium supplements. And don't, if you're a dialysis patient, dialysis patients take phosphate binders. Do not take a calcium-based phosphate binder. Just say, no, I'm not taking it. Ask for a different drug. Um, because we know that in the well population, women who took high doses of calcium supplements had higher risk of cardiovascular disease. So if you are a kidney patient, you're at even higher risk because your kidneys aren't filtering out calcium as much as they should. So don't take a calcium binder. Don't take a calcium supplement. If you're a dialysis patient, look at your labs. If those things are out of whack, try to figure out how am I going to get my phosphorus down, my parathyroid hormone down. Parathyroid hormone is controlled by certain medications in the dialysis center. Um, the only other way that you'll know, but this is when it's gotten pretty far gone, which you would like to get to it before this. 
is if you start itching. If you're a dialysis patient and you're itching, you're laying down calcium. In fact, you probably already got it in your arteries and veins because if you're itching, that means it's coming out in your skin. I used to have dialysis, a dialysis patient that would itch really bad and he would scratch, he would get bumps all over his arms and they would itch. And when he would scratch those bumps, a calcium rock would come out of that bump. That meant that he was calcified. So um, yes, you can know all those ways you can know. Great. Thank you. Uh, Jen says, does it make a difference on potassium if you eat grass-fed, organic, pasture-raised meats without antibiotics or additives? We don't want you to eat that <laughs> in general, even if you're not a kidney patient. But- right. Okay. So go back to what I said about inflammation and acidosis and all that and stay away from the grass-fed, whatever meats. Um, I don't know I, if, if they're organic, I don't, um, I would think they would not inject them with additives, but I, I am not hundred percent sure on that. I, but I would tell you it should be a moot point. I would just stay away from those things. Great. Thank you. And here's another question on kidneys, uh, from, uh, Christissa, are there any specific preventative recommendations for AD? PKD, autosomal dominant polycystic yes. kidney disease. Yes. Okay. ADPKD. Um, that one is a little bit different. There's new, now this is new research. So I'm just telling you, but it's promising. Okay. Using a plant-based ketogenic diet for um, PKD because those cysts, love sugar. Now, when I say that, I am not saying that a plant-based diet is high in sugar, but the, the, the way that, um, a ketogenic diet, the, the, the situation that that creates within the body appears to be showing us that those cysts stop growing and it's smaller. Again, this is new research. So if you, if you go that route, it's not um, 100% nailed down. Uh, there is a company called Santa Barbara Nutrients that is doing a ton of research in this space. Really cool, even global research. So I think it's I think it's you know pretty solid, pretty safe. However, if you do that too, I would tell you work with the dietitian because you don't want to be if you're going to eat a higher fat diet, you want those fats to come from unsaturated plant sources. Um, because otherwise you can increase your risk of cardiovascular disease and you've already got an increased risk if you've got. Thanks. Or just coming in that space. Thank you. Um, I, I don't know what this means. Does having an incision in the megarator affect anything? I don't know what that means. Did I say it correctly? Mega. Spell it. M- mega ureter. Meg. M e g a u r e t r. You read. I don't know what that means. Ureter. Um, gosh, I would have to. See, that's a that's a very specific question. I'd have to look and see what you had done. I'm not 100 percent sure because I just don't know your whole medical history. Sure, I understand. You know, I'm. You know, do people with kidney disease realize? You know, just like what whether it's kidney disease or heart disease, that that their diet not, not to blame them or make them feel bad once they get there, but that their diet had anything to do with their kidney health. You may be fine. You may have healed from that surgery and be fine. But if not, then you may want to go ahead and see a nephrologist and um, and get with a renal dietitian. Thanks. Are you still there? I, I just, there was a little glitch. Yeah, I'm here. Okay. Yeah. Okay. D- did you hear the question I asked about people not understanding or realizing that what they eat has any effect on their kidney health? Oh, no. Okay. Cause I I'm must here- be in a delay. I just answered the question about um... the incision, the incision. Yes. Okay. I was going to say, I was like, what? That doesn't make any sense. Okay. No problem. <laughs> I'll ask okay. it again. The, the patients that you're dealing with, uh, or did their doctors even tell them that their diet had any impact on them getting these diseases in their kidneys? Oh, no. Yeah. That's kind of how it is. Which is terrible. Yeah. 
kind of how it is with all medicine, pretty mm-hmm. much. Yeah, even when there's right. a direct correlation. You know, I once heard a presentation from Dr. McDougall that if you have only one kidney, you better go plant based. And I had, I, I say had, had a friend who generously donated her kidney to a stranger. And I, I shared that video with her and she hasn't talked to me since. But, <laughs> but, but isn't that true that people that yes. are, that if they have, if they give it, have one kidney for whatever reason, they really should consider a plant based diet even more Absolutely. strongly? Absolutely. Yep. And you can live on one kidney. A lot of people will donate a kidney to a family member. Um, But yeah, I mean, at that point, you should be plant-based for sure. Yeah. Um, Do you recommend any special kind of water? Asks Peachy. Well, it kind of depends on where you live. We have a Berkey water filter. I love it. And that's what we drink because it's, we know that it's pure. You could take pond water and put it in that thing and it'll, it'll clear it out. So um, I would tell you definitely be careful with your water. Um, and, and if it's safe or not, you know, just like those kids in Guatemala, the water there, there's another a man in Guatemala, his name's Hilmar. He's amazing. And he goes out all over um Guatemala and puts gives people water filters to help them um, have safe water. Nice. What's the absolute worst thing a person can do for their kidneys? Um, <clears throat> eat a high sodium, high animal based diet. You mean like the standard American diet? Yep. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm sure going and like- getting. Chick-fil-A and Pizza Hut and all the junk food out there. Yeah. And I'm pretty sure smoking is probably not great for the kidneys either. Well, smoking will raise blood pressure. So, yeah. I mean, the thing about blood pressure is this. Blood pressure causes kidney disease and is caused by kidney disease. So, sometimes you don't know which came first, the chicken or the egg. Um, When the kidneys are your main controller of blood pressure. So, when the beginning goes high. But also if blood pressure goes high, it kills the kidneys. So it's, it's a vicious cycle. Yeah. Well, I just, you're, you're just amazing. Thank, I got to, I got to introduce you to Shane. Yeah, that would be great. That would be great. And maybe you can introduce me to the two plant-based nephrologists you mentioned. I'd love to have them on the show. Yeah. Yeah. That'd be really good. And maybe even, um, I would love for you to sometime have a, I don't know if you can bring someone in from another country, but Araldo would be really cool. Absolutely. I mean, yes, absolutely. I have guests from India, Israel. So that would be amazing. And I'm going to send this presentation to the one plant-based nephrologist that I know, Dr. Sean Hashmi, because he needs to know about you because you need to be speaking. Well, we've spoken together. He does. He's, um, we did a panel at the real truth about health. He and I were in a panel together. Wonderful. That's fantastic. Yeah. yeah, he's a very nice man. Well, you are just a delight. Thank you so much, Jen. I really enjoyed talking to you. Well, I had so much fun. I really appreciate it. And I hope this helps a lot of people. And thank you, Chef AJ. Well, thank you. And thanks all of you for watching another episode of Chef AJ Live. Please come back at 11 a.m. Pacific time tomorrow when my guest is a wonderful lifestyle medicine doctor, Dr. I don't even know his name. I have to look here. Timothy O'Donnell. I'll be meeting him for the first time. He's in Indiana. And I think you can even see him virtually. Take care. Take care of your kidneys. Thanks. Thanks, Jen.